Hello the world, hello the internet, hello Jason Isaacs. Hello Theresa May, if you're still our Prime Minister. It's quarter to five. Everything could be changing very, very soon. And that'll just give us more evidence to talk about when we come to discuss the Prime Minister versus the President. Where does power lie? Hope you like the new theme music, by the way. My son said, you need a theme for your YouTube channel. And I went, okay. Why don't you get me one? And so he did. Better than anything I could do. That's setting the bar pretty low, actually. When we're doing this, there's so much to talk about, it's easy to get distracted. In terms of the PM versus CAP, which is really what we're talking about, you need to come up with convincing arguments. That's the critical thing here, and you're going to need three arguments on one side and three arguments on the other, and three points on one side, three points on the other. And don't forget your AO3. This is a third of the marks, and you cannot access the top tier of marks unless you do that. So keep your eye on the prize. We're looking for simplicity and organization and method. You do that, you're gonna be okay. And let's see if we can help you with this presentation. Now, there's a lot to talk about here, and so I'm probably gonna break this into two parts. One part is gonna be the, uh, the technical side, and then the next bit is gonna be the evidence. And the things we're gonna look at really are things like how is power organized within the executive, and what is the nature of parliamentary government. If you know the nature of parliamentary government and you know where power is within the executive, then this, between these two, is where power lies or power accrues to the Prime Minister. Are they dictating terms within the executive and is the executive in a position to start dictating terms to Parliament? This means that we're going to cover the structure of things, we're going to look at the power, the sources of authority, the sources of vulnerability and accountability, the sanctions that can be deployed, some of the working practices and some of the style, appearance and presentation, although to be honest, this is covered in other presentations and we'll get round to looking at those in due course. So, first things first. We have a parliamentary system, uh, parliamentary government in the United Kingdom. That means that government derives all of its authority from parliament. And you should know they are chosen from, they operate through, and they are accountable to parliament. That contrasts dramatically with America, where we have discrete offices, we have separate elections, we have checks and balances. This does not apply in the UK. No, instead, government has this fused relationship, fused structure with government, with parliament, sorry, and from that, we have a very, very different source of power. We have a different, very, very, very different structure of accountability and all that sort of thing. We also have cabinet government in the UK, which says that cabinet is the supreme executive authority within government. Now, this is very, very important. We need to think about executive function, the ability to make decisions. Because that contrasts with the system in America that I'll explain in a second. And then within that, we drill down and we find that the prime minister is primus into pares. That doesn't make sense. It's an oxymoron. How can you be primus into powers? Well, what it really means is that the prime minister will get away with whatever cabinet lets them get away. Um, a prime minister will always push it as hard as they possibly can, and it's up for cabinet to decide when they push back, which is something called elastic theory, of which more later. In the United States, all of that is very, very different because the president enjoys a direct mandate. That means that they have been given election, they've been given uh, authority directly from the people via the direct election. And uh, in that sense, cabinet has a diminished role. In fact, specifically, it has an administrative role. If you remember that, that comes in very, very useful when you look at America later. And again, there we have a useful contrast between an executive instance here, this, uh, this UK being exec, decision-making, whereas in the United States, cabinet is administrative. Very, very important distinction, and uh, we can go on to discuss that later next year. Um, one more thing that we need to talk about is where decisions are being made. I mentioned that earlier. Um, the concept of centralized decision-making, what we mean here is centralized around the PM, as opposed to a collective decision-making entity. 
which is your cabinet, uh, cabinet uh, government. Uh, this will be a series of bilateral informal meetings. So for government, you should know who we're talking about here, as opposed to formal cabinet meetings where we have a clear system of accountability. Over here, it's all very much ad hoc. This is much more uh, organized and discreet. And so here, quite clearly, we're looking at Blair. He is your go-to example for the core executive where decisions were made on the Blair government, sorry, on the Blair sofa, and then later relayed to uh, cabinet cabinet here having a very diminished role uh, much more akin to the american system uh, in, in that it became virtually an administrative entity uh, in over here we're looking at uh, much more organized much more formal uh, cabinet meetings the sort of thing that you might have expected of major and uh, to a certain extent brown um, may is a very very interesting one in case of may we can see that brexit and the election both of those are May initiatives, but everything else uh, seems to have been driven by Cabinet. If you think about the way in which Rudd uh, managed the Home Office, the way in which Hunt in particular managed um, health, and uh, Phil, of course, over at the Treasury, they were doing their thing. They were managing their events, and May was basically taking instruction from them in those orders. In terms of the election and Brexit, on the other hand, May very much having the whip hand and dictating terms uh, there. Uh, so the election was her error entirely, as was the campaign, to be brutally honest. Here's a little more uh, information on that. Uh, things to think about as we're talking about here. Look at where the decisions are being made. This bottom line here, these are advisors in number 10. These ones are special advisors generally. If we're getting more advisors in number 10, then it would suggest that more decisions are being made in number 10. And again, these are SPADs, special political advisors not uh, civil servants. <clears throat> All of this stuff over here you need to know about. These are specific bits of evidence that are going to help you determine where decisions are being made and who is making those decisions and how they're being made. Um, again, these are all explored in other presentations. I don't have time to go into them uh, right now. Uh, but uh, if you can't find the evidence to back those up, do let me know and we can find it. What we need to talk about here is the way in which the Prime Minister deports themselves. We have a presidential wedge in some instances. The idea that the Prime Minister represents themselves as being separate from Cabinet, Party, and sometimes you know Parliament. Blair certainly did that. We had that centralisation of power in the office of the Prime Minister. And here are some very, very good bits of evidence uh, that demonstrate that. May also, we have a very personalised election campaign and her control of Brexit. But again, I think everything else was much more cabinet-driven uh, elsewhere. Um, and <clears throat> again, looking over here, we can see really this is the crux of the matter, that when they get things right, the prime minister enjoys power, the like of which a uh, president can only dream. The reason being that parliament will generally do as it is told. The institutional imbalance and the compliant majority allow for government to dominate parliament, as I have explained uh, in other presentations. And what we're going to find when we look at May is the extent to which the compliant majority has started to dissolve. But I'm starting to get ahead of myself. The big takeaway, however, is that the Prime Minister relies entirely on derived authority. And as a result, the Prime Minister's authority is only as strong as its constituent parts. The Prime Minister relies on the support of Cabinet, the support of Party and the support of Parliament. And all of these can be withdrawn at any time. When that happens, any one layer goes and it becomes virtually impossible for a Prime Minister to maintain uh, their, uh, their office. And this contrasts massively with the President. The President is directly elected and as a result of which they have a very, very different relationship with their punters. We have, perhaps in the UK, the appearance of presidentialism, but the reality of prime ministerialism. No one in the UK, no prime minister can exist indefinitely without the support of party, cabinet and parliament, or indeed by the people, uh, should the election come around. And again, elastic theory, the idea that you can stretch it so far, but at some point it's going to snap back and cause you an almighty problem. This basically is where we are. The election gives the president that direct mandate. In the UK, the people elect parliament. Out of parliament, one party will emerge triumphant. 
The Prime Minister will be the leader of that party and they will then exercise through parliamentary government the creation of government and indeed a cabinet. We have cabinet government within that and the Prime Minister sits as primus inter pares within that particular entity. This is a very, very different beast from this one over here. It works in a different way. When it's rock solid, it is absolutely rock solid. Think Blair, 1997, probably through to about 2005. But the problem is, sometimes that can look a bit shaky. And when it starts to look shaky, the Prime Minister's position can look very, very poor indeed. So, when aligned, it's very, very easy to get things done. The PM dominates Cabinet through patronage agenda and spatial management. Cabinet controls government through collective responsibility. Government controls Parliament through the compliant majority and the institutional imbalance. That is how it is supposed to work. That is how the Prime Minister can get the legislation they want. That is how Blair was able to legislate at such, at such a prodigious rate. However, when, when challenged, we have that total reliance on derived authority. Here's our wobbly tower of power. If that goes, then the Prime Minister really can't survive. And what we're going to do in the next presentation is we're going to look at how that works in practice. I will see you very, very soon. And in the meantime, like and subscribe. See you shortly. We'll play out again with Oscar and my theme soon. See you in a bit. Mm -hmm.